um, thanks. Our next speaker is Nadine Dykstra. And Nadine, why don't you just go ahead and take it away? Thanks, Megan. Let me just see if I can share my screen. I'm confused again how this works. Uh, yeah. Hover over yourself and then hit the button. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, yeah? Yep, yeah, looks beautiful. Work? Okay, cool. Michael, I just wanted to say that your illustrations were amazing. Uh, that was really cool. Um, and I'm not going to talk about uh, how to build a brain, unfortunately, but hopefully it will still be interesting. Um, so my talk is about some of our recent computational modeling and psychophysics work on how our brain might dissociate imagination and reality. So when you're having a visual experience like this, how can the brain know whether this is real or just reflects internally generated imagination? So the brain doesn't know what's going on outside the world. It only has uh, the information that is inside the skull. And recent neuroimaging work has shown that internally generated visual experience, such as during dreaming, memory recall, or mental imagery, relies on similar neural mechanisms as externally triggered perception. For example, neural representations of imagined and perceived stimuli are similar throughout the entire visual system, and the more vivid imagery is, the more perception-like the neural representations are. So this poses a problem for perceptual reality monitoring. Now, which cues could a brain use to dissociate imagery from perception? In the motor control and action literature, the idea of intention is used to dissociate self-generated versus externally generated actions. So the idea is that an intention uh, is coupled with a forward model, which predicts the sensory consequences of the action or the movement. And if the sensory input is then fully predicted by this uh, intention uh, to move, then we, the brain can infer that this is self-generated and not, not something that is changing in the environment. And this same model has been very successful in explaining uh, hearing voices in schizophrenia, for example, where the idea is that the uh, sensory consequences of internal, internally generated thoughts are not discounted for, which means that they are erroneously inferred to be externally generated. Now, could this intention kind of forward modeling also be used to dissociate visual imagery from perception? This is what would be in line with the Perky effect, which is an effect uh, discovered by Mary Chiefs West Perky at the beginning of last century. In her seminal study, she asked her participants to imagine various objects while looking at a certain location uh, on the wall, for example, an apple, and then to describe what they were experiencing. Now, sneakily and unbeknownst to the participant, in the room adjacent to where the experiment was taking place, Perky had installed a magical lantern, which is the stimulus PC of the early 1900s. And she used this to project congruent sensory shapes at the exact same location at which participants were imagining these objects. Now, what happened was that participants did not see and did not notice that these external things were presented and instead attributed this sensory input to their imagery, saying things like, if I hadn't known I was imagining, I would have thought this real. So the idea is that congruent sensory input is then explained as being the result of imagery. Um, and we tried to model this in a very simple signal detection uh, model. So um, the idea is that we're trying to capture this intuition of, you know, when you're imagining anything that is in line with what you're imagining is explained away to be caused uh, by yourself. Uh, we have two different signals, an imagery signal and a perception signal. These are both two-dimensional Gaussians. The details are not very important, but we have a two-dimensional Gaussian so that we can um, simulate um, when imagery and perception are the same or when they are different. And then the important bit here is the suppressive connection between imagery and perception such that when the content is the same, uh, the probability of detecting an external stimulus is reduced because it's explained away by imagery. So this tries to capture the Perky effect in a, in a, in a signal detection uh, model. Now, this kind of assumes that we have awareness of our intentions. So we know that we're imagining and this knowledge is used to explain away um, sensory um, uh, signals. But there are very many instances of imagery where we're not really consciously generating these signals. For example, when we're reading, images kind of pop up in our mind without any uh, kind of outside of our control. Or when we're daydreaming, this rapid stream of mental images kind of flows by and we don't really have to do anything. Or in kind of very deliberate um, 
very negative cases, uh, relivings of traumatic events also definitely happen involuntary. So even though there's no clear intention in these uh, cases, people are generally still able to say that their imagery does not reflect reality. So what other signal could the brain use to make this distinction in these cases? Now, one thing is that imagery and perception also clearly differ in terms of sensory strength. So the phenomenological experience of imagery tends to be a lot weaker and more vague than that of perception, which is very clear and crisp. Mm. These differences in phenomenology can be explained by uh, very cool recent findings in neuroimaging research, uh, which basically say that this might be a direct result of running the visual system backwards. So during imagery, the bottom-up input is missing in the middle layer of primary visual area, visual cortex, and this is exactly where the strong excitatory and driving neurons are located. So this means that the general amplitude of activation is going to be lower during imagery. Furthermore, the signals originate from high-level areas which contain larger receptive fields, which also mean that the precision of the imagery signal is going to be lower throughout the entire visual system. So this um, difference in kind of operate, operating mode of imagery compared to perception leads to clear differences in sensory strength and precision. precision. And maybe these kind of low-level first-order signals could also be used to dissociate imagination and perception. So this is the, what we're trying to model in our second model. And the idea is that um, reality monitoring for visual uh, signals is based on the vividness. So if it's vivid enough, we say it's real. If not, we say it's imagined, very simple. So we modeled this as, um, again, a, sig a simple signal detection theory model, but now the image and perception signals are added together. So there's no kind of explaining away of the imagery signal, but we're just adding them together. And if there's no perception, then this signal is going to be too low, which means that we are going to accurately say it's, uh, it reflects imagination. But if it's high enough, um, then we would say it reflects reality. So in, importantly, this model also assumes that imagery vividness um, and perceptual vividness kind of amounts to the same thing. It's just the sensory strength. So we tried to test this using some online psychophysics. The experimental, the experimental design is kind of inspired by the Perky effect. And what um, the instructions were for participants to imagine left and right or right tilted gratings um, while looking at dynamically changing noise and then rating their imagery vividness after each trial. So they did this on a few trials in a row. And then on the 10th less trial, like in Perky's experiment, unbeknownst to the participant, we presented a grating that was either congruent or incongruent to the one they were imagining. They again had to indicate their imagery vividness. So for the, from the participant's perspective, this last trial is kind of the same as all of the other trials. But then we asked uh, after this last trial, hey, you know, did, was a real stimulus actually presented or was anything you saw only the effect of your imagination? And we used um, only one critical trial per participant. So participants could not build up any expectation of real stimuli being presented. And we used them web-based uh, data collection to get enough power. Now we generated different predictions based on these different models. Um, so we could simulate data. The congruent uh, condition is where the imagery and perception are the same and incongruent is when they are different. Now for the Perky effect, when imagery and perception are the same, um, we expect participants to be less likely to say that a real stimulus uh, was presented because the imagery kind of explains away the perception signal. Furthermore, when participants say that, they, that, the, that, the, stim, that the sensory signal was the result of their imagination, we expect the imagery vividness be, to be higher because in that case, the imagery signal was strong enough to explain away the perception signal. Now, the sensory strength model predicts exactly the opposite pattern. Now, because imagery and perception are added together, we expect an increase in congruent in um, uh, in reality judgments for congruent uh, conditions compared to incongruent conditions. And again, because the vividness and the reality judgments correlate positively, we expect that um, counterintuitively, when participants say they saw real stimulus, they also say that imagery vividness is higher because they cannot dissociate between these two. Now, what did we find? 
surprise, surprise, maybe you could tell from the title already, but we found very clear, uh, clear, find, uh, clear evidence for this sensory strength model. So participants were more likely to say that they saw a real stimulus when they also imagined the same stimulus and their imagery vividness judgments were higher for, um, for reality judgments compared to uh, imagined judgments. Furthermore, when we didn't present the stimulus on the last trial, but still asked participants to indicate whether they saw a real stimulus or not, then hallucinations or false alarms were also still associated with higher vividness uh, than correct rejections, which is also in line with the sensory strength model. Since then, we've confirmed this idea that uh, congruent imagery increases perceptual presence responses in a, a variety of different studies. For example, we see a clear um, lowering of the perceptual presence criterion for congruent imagery, but not for incongruent imagery. So this is during uh, detection task. And we also see uh, a horizontal shift of the psychometric curve really indicating that it seems that this imagery signal is added as sensory evidence to the perceptual uh, presence uh, responses. Now, this kind of suggests that in contrast to uh, what happens during motor control and action, or to how hearing voices are explained in schizophrenia, it seems that intention is not so much of an important signal to dissociate visual imagery and visual perception. Instead, it seems that the total sensory strength might be enough to dissociate these two. And this is in line with something that David Hume already said in 1739, which is that the idea or the imagination of red, which we form in the dark, differs only in degrees of intensity, not in nature, from the impression of or perception of red that strikes our eyes in sunshine. And we now have the contemporary cool neuroscience to back up why this is the case. It might just be a direct effect or a direct yeah, effect of the running a visual system backwards. Now, I think it might be a bit more complicated than this. For example, we can also have very weak perception and still know it's real and not imagined. So uh, probably more factors are important. And we recently wrote a review to try and uh, discuss all these different mechanisms. Um, uh, so if you're interested, do check it out. And I would like to thank you for your attention and thank my collaborators for their great help with this project. Thank you very much, Nadine. That was a really excellent talk. Um, and it looks like we have some time for questions. So there's a, a question in uh, the Q&A box. I'll just read it out loud for the recording here, too. With strong doses of psychedelics, Imagery can be both vivid and unintentional, but people are still often able to tell imagery apart from externally generated stimuli. Do you think this is a pure cognitive effect where people consciously think about whether a stimulus is realistic and consistent with reality, or might there be other automatic processes such as the ones you've spoken about that, that can account for this? So that's a super interesting question. Thanks, Eric. And we do talk about that in the review, so <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure. So what we talk about in the review is that maybe this background knowledge, like I know I take, I've taken psychedelics kind of, um, can, uh, can help, uh, uh, people to dissociate reality from imagination. Uh, but in those cases, I, I think people, uh, do experience. So, so there's a difference between knowing something is real and knowing something is imagined versus experiencing something as real and experiencing it as, as imagined, right? So I would suggest that in these cases, maybe people experience these hallucinations as real, but they kind of know cognitively that they're not real, which might be slightly different mechanisms. But yeah, this is all very speculative and I don't have a very conclusive answer, <laughs> but thanks. Great, thank you. Um, it looks like there are no other questions in the Q&A box. Um, and so in the last like 20 seconds, um, I was just wondering <laughs> if you, so you, you kind of have this idea that um, it's the inputs to layer four that are really driving these differences in strength, or at least that's part of the, the big difference. So if you were to do layer wise fMRI, would you expect that like the layer four activity is the thing that actually differentiates between reality and imagination judgments? Um, so I was like, yes, 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 and then no. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's a bit difficult. So um, how we hypothesize is, is that this reality monitoring system is a high level 
kind of frontal system. And I don't think that system would have direct access to layer yeah, four. That was my right? So that in that sense, no. But uh, probably the, the the readout at higher like visual areas is influenced by that a lot, right? Because if there's not this driving activity, then the high level areas of activation is going to be lower as well. So my answer is going to be like, yes, it's very important, but it's not the one signal, I don't think. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Okay. Um, and while, while I was asking that question, three more came in. Um, and so <laughs> we can um, maybe we can pick one of these very quickly and answer it. And then we'll be setting up for the next talk. Um, so there's there's three here, <laughs> or, or we can answer them uh, in text. Um, I think everyone really enjoyed your talk. Maybe we can do uh, uh, Mm. The, just pick one. <laughs> just pick one. I'll pick one. Yeah. So, so this one here. Um, how do you measure vividness in experiment when we are dreaming? We are fooled into thinking that the dream is real because it's very vivid. So, how does one do this experimentally? Yeah. So, in in an experiment, very boring. We just ask people to indicate it on a scale. That's very boring. Sorry about that. Uh, dreaming is super interesting because there's gonna there's two possibilities. So, I don't know if you remember in my talk we had this reality monitoring threshold. Uh, so if it's vivid enough, it's real and otherwise it's, you know, imagined. Uh, and I, one of our hypotheses is that during dreaming, the threshold goes down. So it's not that the experience itself is more vivid, but we more vivid, but we think it's more vivid because the threshold is lower. But I mean, that's very speculative again and uh, no idea how to test that, but super interesting. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Well, there are a bunch more questions in the Q&A box, and so you can feel free to address those in text. But unfortunately, we are out of time here, and we need to move on to our last speaker of the session. Thank you, Nadine, for the excellent